Hello, everyone. Welcome once again to Mentorship Monday. This uh, is, I think, episode number three of the second yeah. season. Uh, That's episode right. two or three of the second season, yeah. <laughs> Exciting That's... to uh, say the second season. <laughs> That's great. And welcome, Nick. Thank you once again for being with us. Oh, I'm um, sorry. We don't have an hand sec today. He's um, you know, taking some some time off, uh, probably in the background. Uh, you know, he's actually uh, chatting, calling me Grandpa Ari. Okay, thank you very much for the nickname. That's going to stick. Uh, okay, it's the Nick. Voice in the back of the ears, you know, uh, giving us our cues. <laughs> no, yeah, we're um, really excited today for the guest that we have. We're going to be who uh, is our guest today. We have uh, Chris Evans, HackerOne's new CISO and Chief Hacking Officer. He, he really has uh, an impressive background in security. It includes uh, founding VSFTPD, Chrome Security, Project Zero, and at Google. And he also ran uh, security at Tesla and Dropbox. So before coming to HackerOne, he's got the experience that you know is incredibly impressive. And we're really excited to have him join us and to join us to speak today. Uh, and by the way, I'm, I'm reading the chat and just to make sure everyone is aware, this is not the Captain America Chris Evans, is the Google <laughs> Project Zero <laughs> Chris Evans. So I'm, I'm pretty sure he's actually pretty tired of that joke. And we are helps him keep to... a low profile online because <laughs> if you Google him, you will, <laughs> even Chris that's... Evans security, you will find a fair number of Captain America pictures. <laughs> that's actually, uh, that's actually pretty, pretty fair, pretty good. And maybe it's a technique, you know, just to hide yourself a little bit. Okay. So without further introductions, uh, let's welcome our guest, Chris. Good morning. Good hey, morning. Chris. Hey, how are you doing? Going? Thanks good for joining us, Chris. And uh, I'll never get tired of the Captain America jokes, I think. <laughs> That's uh, I, I know you probably hate it. You're just being nice, but you know it's uh, for for our, our, the comic fans out there. You just you know, Hugh Chris Evans is Captain America. That's it. So yeah, we might need um, an H one elite that you know uh, kind of mimics that. <laughs> and and by the way, I'm I'm getting Grandpa Ari as a nickname, so I, I will definitely stick with Captain America. I will say <laughs> Captain Hacker in the chat here. I, I like that unique name. <laughs> Here's the Captain Hacker. Okay. So, Chris, welcome. Thank you one more time for, for being here. Um, we, we always do the same question at the very beginning. So tell us about yourself, who you are, what do you do, uh, and you know everything you want to share with us. Happy to. So um, I am a hacker. I've been a hacker for uh, about 25 years now. Uh, that number's getting <laughs> a, little, a little large for my liking. Um, but, but I'm still a hack. I, I still hack things from time to time, just maybe not as much as I used to. Um, I have, uh, well, you introduced me very well, but uh, aside from being a hacker, I've also uh, helped hackers by, by leading them in initiatives such as uh, Google Chrome security team. Uh, I started uh, Google Project Zero, a team of uh, elite hackers to, to go and hack whatever they wanted or whatever they felt needed hacking for the safety of the internet. And as you say, I um, have uh, helped security leadership roles at Tesla, Dropbox. And uh, now I'm really excited to be here at HackerOne as uh, SPISO and, and Chief Hacking Officer. Well, we're excited to have you. And uh, you know, I think that really kind of leads into a, a good question of when you joined HackerOne, you know, what's your vision for your role? And it's you know exciting that you have kind of this dual role. Um, could you get, maybe you know, lay out some of your goals and what excites you about it? Yeah, so I have this uh, these, this dual title, uh, CISO and, and Chief Hacking Officer. Uh, I think we all know what a CISO is. Um, one of the things I do is keep HackerOne safe, keep, keep all of everyone's data safe. Uh, that's the CISO role. Uh, the CISO role also has some externally facing components, such as um, talking to customers and so on. So perhaps it's more interesting to perhaps the more interesting title to everyone here is going to be a Chief Hacking Officer title, because that is not a not such a common title as, as CISO. But what it is, it is um, bringing the, the voice of the hacker um, to the executive table. It is making sure that when hacker one, the company is making decisions, then the feedback of hackers is listened to and represented in what we do to make sure that um, both, both sides of our marketplace is, uh, is healthy, to make sure that hackers are pairing with enterprise customers in a really productive way. Uh, and I'm really excited to continue to define that. And I do hope to, to have, have more to share in the near future in that space. 
that, that that's amazing. And I, I think you probably are one of the first chief hacking officers, you know, in uh, the industry. And I, I can't say I'm familiar with seeing many in that role. So it's exciting that, you know, adding another first to your list of many uh, security firsts. <laughs> and, uh, you know, going off of that, did, did you, while you were, you know, getting started and growing up in hacking, you know, ever see yourself becoming a CISO? Was that something you, you know, saw as a, you know, potential goal or, you know, how, how did that uh, come into mind? Well, it cast my mind back again, 25 years. Um, I don't think there were many full-time dedicated security jobs at that time. This, this 25 years ago, security was a very different landscape. And um, even just getting employed as a hacker uh, on a, say, a product security team or, or a red team, just the opportunities were, were very minimal 25 years ago. So when I started, hacking was just, just my hobby. It was, um, it was what I enjoyed to do the most. It was where I enjoy, I, I found a, an unusual amount of creativity in hacking. And I loved expressing that creativity. Um, but I didn't really, in the early days of hacking, my hacking, uh, think about full-time jobs in this space, let alone bug bounty, because those didn't come for a few years. Um, so I just did it to learn. I did it because I enjoyed it. Um, I did it because I really enjoyed the intellectual challenge. Um, I hacked a lot of open source. I hacked a lot of I hacked the Linux kernel. These these were the these were the things. It was it was cool to hack back at twenty five years. <laughs> um, and th and then a few years later, that you know the the world started to change, and and full time um, security jobs did did start to be to become a thing. Um, I'm not sure I ever saw myself becoming a, a, a CISO, um, but the more I hacked and the, the the more experience I got hacking, the more I realized I enjoyed helping new hackers come into the fold, ha helping new hackers hack on things that were impactful, helping them be effective. And uh, at Google, I got to employ a lot of hackers and I really enjoyed just being part of this first wave of, of opening, of full-time openings for hackers and uh, providing a, providing a, a full-time opportunities for hackers. That's, that's great. Um, question, do you, do you think things will have been different if back when you were paying a couple of thousands back in your days, like 25 years ago, <laughs> or you will still be a CISO. So, so if hacker one had existed back in the day and were, were <laughs> paying large bounties, how, how would things have gone? Yeah. That's hard to say. I, know. Um, I think it would have been dangerous to give me when I was like 20 years old, a couple, couple of grand on a regular basis. <laughs> That's that's great. Uh, and by the way, speaking of Hack One, you have been advising Hack One before you joined your your current position. That's correct, right? Yeah, that's right. I I can talk about how how that came to be. Um, yeah, how how was that exactly? How that happened, and maybe how how you even met the the founders? Yeah. So um, so this goes back not quite twenty five years now, thankfully. But this goes back to the year <laughs> twenty ten, which is now as twelve years ago. But um, in, in again, in the year 2010, still things are very different. There were very, very few bug bounty programs, and the ones that existed were not particularly high profile. So uh, this was at Google. We launched the first bug pro bounty program we launched at Google was the um, Chromium vulnerability rewards program used to back backing the open source project behind Google's Chrome web browser. And we wanted to do things differently. We wanted to sort of modernize things a little bit right from the start. So we, we did some, you know, just went on, went on some pioneering. We just, you know, experimented with um, different reward values. I think we were the first bug bounty program to try and make it a little bit fun and engaging for the hackers. Like we, we best I know, we were the first reward. We had the first reward value of $1,337 or, or LEET um, reserved <laughs> for someone we thought was um, not just not just an impactful finding, but also really clever or creative. Um, so, so that program was 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 um, successful. Um, based on that, the same year we launched the, <clears throat> the just Google, the massive Google program. I think I think a first uh, program just for an internet giant saying, "Hey, please come and test our web properties, our web services, anything you find hanging out on the internet. Uh, we will that's in scope. We will we will reward you um, for, for findings that help us lower lower the risk, lower our risk and our customers' risk." And that that was a hit. Um, and that was going really well. And it was on the back of that that I met Alex Rice, HackerOne co-founder. At the time, he was working for Facebook. And 
they I guess they're paying attention to how well our program was going at Google and how it was really helping secure Google and find creative and interesting things. Uh, so he popped over for lunch to Google and we just chatted and said about what went well, um, what, what he should watch out for, just talked about should he do it, what, what are things could he do differently. Uh, it's a great conversation and I, I, I guess I was persuasive because not long <laughs> after uh, Facebook um, launched launched their bug bounty program. And from that, Alex and I you know, formed a friendship. And um, a few years later, when he was forming Hacker One, uh, he, he asked me if I would be a founding advisor. And I, I said, I, I would be delighted to. The, I really believe in this model. The more I can do anything that might scale it out to more companies, more hackers, I would be delighted to, to try and help. That's, that's a great story. And actually, I wasn't aware of it. So thank you for, for the help. And, you know, uh i i guess we we probably own you some some part of pack one being where it is today so that's that's awesome um you were talking about project zero and um, that's I, I guess one of the most interesting topics we have here and we have a bunch of hackers in the chat uh that probably heard about uh but just in case some of those haven't what was project project zero from from google google project zero so yeah um founded in i think 2014 um, the mission of Google Project Zero is to to make is to make it hard to comp to hack someone to compromise someone. Um, so a fairly a fairly broad mission, uh, you could say. Um, uh, the the team sprang up because when looking at um, Google's own security story, it, very, Google has always had a very strong security story. Google has always employed a very large number of hackers, a very large number of uh, you know, world class, well known hackers. Um, so we, when when founding Project Zero, or before founding Project Zero, we had a look at if Google did someone did come and try to hack Google, how how would that occur? What would that look like? Would you like directly attack the websites themselves? Uh, you know, maybe not because we had this <laughs> wonderful bug bounty program, and um, it was it was pretty pretty hardened attack surface, I would say. So we thought it was more likely that someone would attack Google through. Um, through malware that might land on one of the laptops of, of, of the company of a company employee. And of course, laptops are used by everyone everywhere. Um, and they might be Microsoft laptops, they might be Apple laptops. Uh, they might also be a Chromebook, of course, but um, Microsoft and Apple laptops and desktops are very common. And so our thinking was, well, if, if this is how we might get attacked, why don't we secure that too, since we're doing so well in other areas of security? And um, so we decided we would. Uh, that is that is that is the, the start of Google Project Zero. That's that's amazing. And what were your first couple of bugs uh, you found in Google Project Zero? If you can share something, you know, without disclosing any any, you know, without getting any problems here, um, what are the first couple of bugs you you actually found as as a result of that? Oh well, the great thing about Project Zero is it is a team that practices science. It means they find something, they they publish it and uh, for people to build on, for people to learn from. So the track record of Google Project Zero um, is, is you find that in two primary places and it's all public. Um, one place, if you want to go to the, the, the full stream and detail of all the issues that were found, you go to the, the um, Google Project Zero bug tracker. And there's like, I'm not sure what the latest figure is. Is it a couple of thousand <laughs> <laughs> of disclosure? It's certainly more than 1,000. And there's a huge body of information there. Uh, and there's also the, the public facing blog where some of the more interesting issues were, where we thought there was perhaps more to learn from and some broader conclusions to draw or some really interesting tech uh, that, that would result in, in a blog post where we would go and just <clears throat> explain the, the particular art of exploitation that was used for a particular issue, um, why the bug was interesting, how it was found, how you might find more, uh, all of these things in, in, a, in a more sort of long, long blog post format. Uh, again, a great resource to learn from. Um, so the first few issues I remember, I think the, the first issues we we got were kind of dominated by who we hired. So we would hire people and we wouldn't really try and pigeonhole them into you're working on this, you're working on that. I think hackers are best when they have the, the greatest f freedoms, when you don't really tell them so much about what they have to go and find, but just tell them to go and find something interesting. And that's when that's when the creativity of hackers, I find, will, will flourish. And that's how we hired people at Project Zero. So we, we found people that were obviously very talented, but then we tried not to be too prescriptive in what they would go and find. So um, 
Uh, a friend of mine, Ian Beer, was one of our earliest hires. He just happened to um, own a, a MacBook and, and enjoy using it. He also enjoyed hacking it. So a lot of the early bugs <laughs> we found were were um, Apple, Mac OS um, kernel vulnerabilities because that's what he enjoyed. Um, we also hired um, uh, James. Um, he likes hacking Windows, so a lot of early findings were um, were, were Windows, <laughs> Windows, Windows bugs. Um, we hired we transferred Mateus internally. He liked hacking hacking fonts, so um, a lot of our early bugs were Windows kernel font parsing issues. Um, it's, uh, it's really amazing how you're able to bring in all these, you know, independent, you know, security mindsets and, you know, form a team around that. You know, that's, I think, something that a lot of uh, folks, you know, don't realize, you know, there's a, you created ways for hackers to come together and like previously, you know, they would operate independently. And that that's, I think, one of the really cool things to see with Project Zero. Can you maybe... Um, walk us through some of the challenges, you know, that you faced with these larger organizations or anything that you ran into um, trying to advocate for hackers or bringing hackers on. And, you know, maybe this can speak to you. You've been able to see it from, you know, really the beginning of bug bounty to its current day. Like how has uh, the normalization of hackers over time, you know, anything that you've noticed that you found particularly interesting? Yeah, I, I'll let the, use the word normalization of hackers and hacking. And that, that is, if I had to try and come with a crisp summary of what we tried to do, during, uh, many of us during, the, during the, the years we were together at Google, and that was normalize hacking. Um, and and that, um, we did that from two angles. When, when someone hacked us at Google, we tried to model how you should behave. So that means when we received a, uh, a report, we would... I genuinely be happy we received this report. This was information that would enable us to uh, lower the risk of our company, our customers, and we tried to let that happiness shine through to the to the hackers we interacted with. Like when when someone sent us and it was something, it was a good bug for whatever reason. You know, it was more severe than usual. It was more creative than usual. We would try and say, "Wow, that's cool," and just be be warm and friendly with the hackers and just normalize receiving issues as being a good thing, not something not something to be to be afraid of. Uh, and of course, we tried to normal. We started the, the journey of normalizing, um, rewarding <laughs> via via bounties, for monetary rewards for for, for um, valuable work. Um, on the on the other side, we we also tried to standardize and, and, and normalize how we would send issues to external companies. Uh, again, along the same lines, we we tried to um, be be positive and represent the, the the value we were bringing. We tried to. Um, we try to get people to see this as a good thing, not not a bad thing, right? If if people receive a security vulnerability in there, they don't know what to do with it. The risk is that they'll instinctively, um, you know, call the lawyers, <laughs> call call the PR people, call call all of the wrong people, right? And, and <laughs> um, when the in fact the right people to call are the, the engineers who who will be excited to learn from you know um, something in, in the product that could be improved and maybe could be generally improved across the platform. Um, there's always a lot to learn from every issue that comes in. Like, why did this happen? How can we stop anything like this from, from happening again in the future? So we, yeah, we um, we just try to companies that were new to this, that getting as in new to receiving vulnerability reports. We, we try and also not just give them the report, but walk through why this was good, uh, how 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 we could help them see this as a, a great thing, and um, some sometimes it worked. <laughs> That, no, that's that's amazing, and it, clearly it's exciting how much of this, you know, you were building and testing and seeing, you know, uh, really doing this from scratch or really uh, as things were quickly evolving. So I, I think one of the things that, you know, is uh, really exciting about what you're working on and what you worked on earlier was this 90-day disclosure policy, you know, um, if you could speak to, um, you know, maybe how you came up with that and why it wasn't, you know, 30, 45 or 180. Yeah, I guess pick a number, pick, pick any number. Um, <laughs> and this is one of those cases where having any number is better than having no number. Um, so to just to, to, to wind it back a bit, um, the, the reason for disclosure deadlines is that we want, as security practitioners, we want to lower the amount of risk that's out there on the internet. 
that's why we do this. It's one of the main reasons we do this. We we find something that's a risk uh, to to a company to to the data of users that use a given company. Um, we don't want to make a huge deal out of it. We just want it fixed, right? And the quicker it's fixed, the the less the less risk that we're carrying there. And, and this concept has been along since the the beginning of, of hacking and, and security. And you can you can see debates on this going going back. Uh, I've been doing this 25 years, and the debates go back, you know, significantly longer than that. And um, so, I think everyone agrees that we want to fix these risks when we, when we, when we find out about them. So the question becomes, how how long is it reasonable as a uh, as a company and, and as a hacker to sit on a risk that you know about, whilst it's not fixed? Is that answer one day? Is it is it zero days? <laughs> is it is it two years? And um, this is there's a huge diversity of opinion in this area. Some people do think that if they find a, a risk, they should just publish it for everyone to do whatever they want with to um, to, to to mitigate that that risk uh, immediately if they wish. Um, that's full disclosure. There are proponents of that, and uh, then there are some somewhat less progressive corporations that think you should never talk about any of this, and perhaps they perhaps it's too much hassle to fix security bugs because you know you might. <laughs> You might break something, uh, and uh, when you when apply you in a patch, might break yeah, something else, right? <laughs> you might, you know. Yeah. So, um, as you might imagine, with with these with things like this, as the reality is that the, the correct balance usually lies somewhere in the middle of two extremes, and we picked ninety days because it it seemed like a reasonable balance based on what we were seeing, based on data. I think what was missing from this conversation is data. Uh, like at Google, we had sent a lot of vulnerability reports to a lot of companies, and we had data on how fast it, it is possible to fix security vulnerabilities. Um, we had data on on security vulnerabilities that were sent over normally. We had data on how fast companies can really move when they have to, if they've been hit by a zero day in the wild. And we think 90 days is a very, very, quite perhaps, perhaps slightly generous amount of time, but a definitely a, a target that everyone could hit. Um, uh, at the time, the U.S. government, their, their standard was 45 days, so it was not unreasonable, 90 days. That was even more time than the U.S. government suggested you should take to fix a security vulnerability. Um, and as always, when you when you take two sort of camps that are on uh, have different views, you know, zero days, two years, and find, find a middle ground, you'll get people that are unhappy at either ends of that spectrum. Um, but mostly we think people were broadly people... Um, people were happy with the 90 day compromise and and for those who were actually not happy um how many enemies uh you actually gain or maybe not you personally but the project zero uh you know gain thanks to the 90 day policy and maybe people not not being fast enough to fix or, or patch something uh, do you get some some fans you know uh, some saying mail. good things and some yeah some hate mail on the other side or you know everything was was slow it's interesting yeah so that's not not to name any any specific companies but um um you know there are certain large companies out there that have a responsibility because they 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 create software that is the foundations of the of the internet that we that we use and um there there were some there were some tense moments uh briefly for a while <laughs> um but um what we found is there was, there was actually a split, I think, in opinion. So the, the engineers at the large companies, security engineers at large companies, they loved this policy because it, they had been pushing internally for less risk, more security for years. And they didn't like how long their processes uh, took to fix things. So they, they loved that they had this uh, tool with which to say, well, now we have to fix it faster. And on the flip side, there you know there are some executives that um, are a little bit regressive in their thinking and wanted to see everything as a fight. They didn't they they wanted to see everything as a shot across the bowels from a competitor. Uh, and um, you know you can imagine the sort of uh, old fashioned Type A executive, right? That <laughs> wants to wants to turn everything into a battle. And unfortunately, we we uh, I think where where there where there were disagreeing public disagreements, it was because there was there was just the wrong type of executive in, in the wrong position. I wanted to see everything as a fight, um, and that's quite incorrect. Project Zero is one hundred percent founded on the principles of the people who founded Project Zero. 
So the principles of Project Zero are the principles of experienced security engineers, nothing more, nothing less. There's no competitive aspect to Project Zero. It's just people who want to make things safer and happen to be employed by Google. That's the correct lens through which to, to see Project Zero. See it as a collection of, of hackers, not as not as a collection of Google employees. And uh, a really great point there, uh, you know, that you were able to become this independent advocate for all the security engineers, regardless of what organization they were at. Yeah, I mean, Google still uh, kept the lights on, paid yeah. the salaries, <laughs> but the, the the policies you saw, um, the the choice, the selection of what to work on, that all came from individual talented security engineers. That makes sense, and and also you know makes sense that if you are using any hardware or software in your company, you might want to be vulnerable because you are using that. So, uh, but I also get the optics from the outside, like oh. Google is hacking Apple and Microsoft, you know, like that looks like uh, on purpose or something, but. Definitely. Yeah, that's why you just need to have a, a lot of maturity. Like people will always say things. The media loves to say things because you know, <laughs> the media loves controversy and this looked like controversy. So yeah, uh, yeah the, the, one of the challenges in security, and I think we may get to this in some of our questions later. Uh, one of the big, one of the biggest skills you can have in security, to be honest, is is um, uh, right there up alongside technical skills is maturity. There's maturity. So when people are like raging and saying, saying things and pointing fingers, just staying calm is a huge, huge, huge skill. If you want to start working on something new today, uh, work, work on that, work on that. And, you know, we were talking about the 90 days and how you disclose these vulnerabilities and that kind of thing. And, you know, comes to mind back bounty, uh, you know, that kind of change, right? It's not like, oh, everyone can disclose everything and, you know, there are policies to follow and safe harbors and, uh, and a lot of rules to follow. Um, what are your recommendations for, for the hackers that are maybe starting, maybe are, you know, newer in back bounty, but they are maybe skilled hackers and they might find, you know, these policies and these rules hard to follow because they come from that, you know, mindset of I need, you know, to disclose everything after 90 days or something like that. What, what are your recommendations for, for those type of profiles? Yeah, so one of the complexities of, of bug bounty programs is that every bug bounty program is likely to have a slightly different twist on all of those things you mentioned. So um, you know, you'll see different text for safe harbor. You'll see different text for policy. You'll see different text for scope. You might see a different, different interactions between scope and policy. So... Uh, most important thing to do when you're interested in hacking on the new program, you know, it sounds exciting. You, you think you might want to go, go and start on a new program is make sure you've read and actually understood those documents, the safe harbor policy scope, uh, because uh, the last program you, you hacked on is, may have you know, subtle differences to the new program you're, you're thinking of hacking on. And once you've read them, um, you have a choice to make. You have a choice to make. You don't have to hack on any program. You are in, as a hacker, you're in control. You have a, you can choose to hack on a program or not. And if you do choose to hack on a program, it is important that you make a best faith effort to follow the, the rules outlined in the policy and the scope. And if you if you don't agree with a particular program's rule scope policy, you can either not participate in that program on Hacker One, or you can. Um, or if you still have a finding to submit and you don't like the the program policy on Hacker One, you you know you go back to the the old days of um, our, our, our communication via you know the product security email address or something like that. If you if you, if you wish to if you wish to use um, a different set of, of policy and scope, but then of course um, you won't be you won't be considered for for bounty. So uh, those are those are the choices that that you have to make. So I think you want to be aware of. I think you want to be aware that you have a choice to participate in a program or not and be aware of what you're agreeing to when you participate in a given program. That's a good advice. Check the policy. If you're not agreeing on that, just go to a different program, right? Yeah, it's important, I think, to remember all the opportunities there are, you know, lots of programs on HackerOne. You can don't like the scope or policies, there's, there's a different one. <laughs> Yeah, and do give feedback, right? It is very important um, to both Hacker One and, and the customer. Like, if uh, it's very important for everyone to know who is hacking on what programs and why, and we can take that information 
uh, as a as a bucket of data and use that to try and generally improve uh, guide policies and and um, uh, policies and scope for for all customers going forward. Um, and you know, the, on occasion, when given feedback, a, a customer might make a change to their their scope or policy based based on feedback. And here at Hacker One, and uh, I'm certainly interested in learning all of the reasons that. Uh, a, given, a given program is considered uh, good or bad on the policy side so that I can take that again, take that information away with me and use that to try and direct all programs in, towards um, towards a more hacker-friendly place. Yeah, I, I think um, it's worth looking at, you know, how you've advocated for hackers in the past from your role running uh, bounty programs. Can you maybe I, I, we understand there's certain uh, specifics you maybe can't get into, but you know, speaking to some of the you know themes that you've picked up along the way from how you've uh, helped turn some you know sour situations uh, into a bit more positive. Um, yeah, um, I guess I got most of my bug bounty experience on the first one I launched, which was the Chromium Vulnerability Reward Program uh, launched in 2010. And um, some of the things I learned there, I think I did, I did carry forward into into the management of some of the programs I was um, looking after later in my career. But um, I think the thing I the thing I took away that really worked from the Chromium program was that the just just the human just the human relationships. The more you get to know your hackers, the more you the more you have honest, authentic conversations with hackers. Um, the more you the more you have a back and forth as opposed to a, a more prescriptive flow of, of, of a report, uh, the more you would build those connections and just the more the more value and trust you would gain in those relationships. And that's what enables you to turn around any disagreements to a more positive space is if you've got that, if you've got that trust, if you've got that history of listening, uh, history of, um, you know, share, not being afraid to share ideas I think have, building that trust, um, both in individual cases and just generally across the program, so that the program itself was known to, to operate with with, in, with integrity and, and could be trusted. I think uh, getting that in place enabled us to uh, yeah turn around those those disagreements much more easily. Yeah, it really seems like you you're um, describing like what's a well-rounded hacker, and it's this mix of you know technical ability, but also emotional intelligence and, you know, advocating for hackers, you know, that you work with them on that side as well. It's not just, a, you know, the, the reports are, of course, important, but the ability to, you know, speak with people, I think, is uh, definitely a skill that you brought to the table. Yeah, on, on both sides, I would recommend um, asking questions rather than making statements. This is how you, you learn about each other's point of view. And how you build trust. So, for example, if you get a uh, report back, it comes back as NA. You know, you have a you have a choice. You can go and make a, a statement that is you're very angry, <laughs> or you can ask a question. Right? You can. You know, you always have time to ask a few questions before making you, your own personal final determination of, of what the situation it really is. So, the question, you know, simple question, would be why is this report NA? Why, why is this determination here different to this similar report over here? And, you know, and you always ask as nicely as you can. And on the on the program side, you know, if a hack is disagreeing, instead of just pressing the close button and moving on, you know, you, maybe you've missed something. So, oh, could you give me a bit more detail as to why you think there's an, an, ang an angle here that's a little more serious than we're anticipating? You know, having that willingness to ask why on both sides, I think, um, shows a little bit of, of, of um, trust and we'll, we'll build those relationships. Spe speaking about trust, do you think the the company is changing, and you know there is more trust in working with hackers? Um, of course, when when you started like twenty five years ago, maybe trust with hackers was was not there, right? You know, hacker was this bad word, and you know had this bad connotation, negative connotation. Uh, we are all trying to change, uh, but do you think that, or do you see, you know, from your experience uh, that? There's more trust with hackers, and you know things are changing for the good. Uh, totally, uh, the landscape now. Whilst there's still much work to do, if I look at uh, where we are now versus where we are 25 years ago, it's uh, night and day. 
So um, I was on a, a, another webinar just this the other day where we were talking about the uh, Hacker One's Hacker Powered Security Report, and the trust of hackers came up as as a question. And uh, we answered it a few different ways, and it came up a couple of times during the webinar. But the thing that really sticks with me in this space is that if you if you look at which industry sectors are growing the fastest in terms of um, launching bug bounties and partnering with hackers, one of the fastest growth areas is financial services. Um, of course, financial services covers a lot of um, a broad space, but within that, full full banks. <laughs> so just just put, put a, a very crisp word on it. So we're seeing an increasing number of banks as customers, like household names in many different countries, um, many, many different banks, uh, new banks coming in every month. Uh, who are asking hackers to to come and you know hack the bank <laughs> for good, <laughs> and and friendly hackers are helping banks increase their level of security. You know, reduce the risk of a big financial breach or a big breach of um, personal information. Uh, you know, if banks can do this. If banks can trust hackers, anyone can. Surely, anyone can. And yeah, uh, when we, I see that's it, what... it makes me smile no, when I see more and more banks. Uh, <laughs> More and more banks signing up with with Hacker One and other cons more conservative verticals too. But I think banks is the one that everyone will resonates with me certainly, and may resonate with hopefully. Um, yeah, banks and financial companies, or maybe healthcare, right? As well, uh, maybe are more healthcare, aviation, are both growing, growing fast. Yeah. Well, and you know the government maybe that's also a big a big name. <laughs> um, in the U.S., the Department of Defense has embraced. Hackapod security enthusiastically, and in the UK, I just recently met uh, some some people in the Ministry of Defence who are running some of these programs. Uh, and again, that's there. So, uh, it's huge. Your governments are saying, "Hey, uh, come hack us! Show us where the nation states could hack us, so that we can fix it first before the nation states do come and hack us." And that's, again, yeah, if governments can partner with hackers yeah. and banks, then then anyone can. So yeah, the, the the landscape has changed, and I'm really really excited to, to, to see see that change continue. And and you know, w keeping with the you know with the same line, uh, speaking about trust, um, sometimes there are hackers that you know maybe get angry or maybe they can't manage the you know the frustrations, um, and and then they do something wrong. Maybe they expose something or they go on Twitter and complain and, you know, they do these kind of things. And I feel like that kind of, you know, damages the community in, in a way because it, you know, hurts that trust that a lot of companies and, and you know, institutions are uh, giving, you know, to the hackers. Uh, do you know or do you have any, um, you know, advice or something to manage that frustration uh, and I guess, you know, maybe asking you your experience, I guess that maybe 20 years ago probably happened to you. You got frustrated uh, while reporting a vulnerability or, while, or, you know, while, while hacking and trying to help a company and maybe they didn't want to listen. Uh, so what were your advices? And if you want to share any story that you have, that will be awesome. Yeah, we've all been there, right? We submit a security vulnerability somewhere and we get a result that for some reason we don't like and we're not happy about it. And yeah, this... um. I'm struggling to think of specific examples, but uh, just when I was like 20 years old, I just know that I um, had situations where I was unhappy and I, I didn't react to it in the, the best of ways. And, and uh, you know, looking back later, much later in life, you know, I think, I think, oh, I really wish I'd handled that better. Uh, so that's one piece of advice is just if you can work on this now, you know, don't don't be me, that person that looks back at some bad behavior 25 years ago and, and, and just uh, regrets it that, you know, that I was unkind to someone in the heat of the moment because they didn't give me the answer I wanted. Right? Um, so yeah, in terms of, uh, in terms of concrete advice, uh, you know, again, it comes to having a choice. So you've got a, you've got an answer you don't like. And, it, and at that, that moment, the heat of the moment, you've got a choice. You can go off on a rage and start posting things on Twitter, you know, and, and risk even worse outcomes. <laughs> it, it never makes it better. <laughs> <laughs> I think anyone can think of a case where they made it better. Um, or you can just see if there's a few other more mature steps you can take before you go and then take the, the more aggressive action. And, and maybe by the time you've tried a few more things first, you may have calmed down a bit and you may take a and you may take still a firm action if you think that's the right thing to do, but one that's less likely to to cause um, uh, cause cause problems for uh, for everyone, including yourself. 
So the the first thing I would recommend is if you do know you're having having challenges uh, receiving a, a result you don't want to hear is maybe um, I think I may have tried this when I, when I was younger the twenty four hour rule right. So if you're really enraged about something and this is hard to do because you it's the heat of the moment but uh, whatever thing you're thinking of doing do it twenty four hours later and if you still feel exactly the same twenty four hours later then uh, okay maybe but you find out that often you you won't if you. With a bit of calmness, you're sort of think through. We're hackers. We're very logical at thinking through. If I do this, then that. Thinking outcomes, right? So wait until enough time has passed. You can use your, um, you know, we're all very clever here. Use your hacker cleverness to think through the outcomes. If I do this, this will happen. If I do that, that will happen. <laughs> and I guarantee you, you'll you'll work out some what will happen. Then you'll you'll have a with a calmer approach. Maybe you'll you'll, you'll choose something different. Uh, the other thing uh, we we uh, actually had a pre-chat with, with Ariel and Nick here, and um, we really think it, if you're early on your journey and you're getting some results that you don't think are correct, maybe try and find someone that's um, just that little bit ahead of you on this journey, someone who has gone through those first few bug reports that maybe didn't go the way they were hoping, and then transitioned to um, some bug reports that um, did finally land that first bounty, perhaps. And... Um, just uh, having someone to talk to about their journey and how they handled this appointment and just bounce, bounce those ideas off, you know, hey, is this a reasonable result or not? Just having that person you trust to as a, as a backstop, you know, is this the correct result for this, 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 uh, for this, um, for this issue I filed, you know, should I be upset about this or, or maybe, maybe it's reasonable. And just having someone you trust to be a second pair of eyes on that, on that unfortunate situation uh, is, is really valuable. This is great advice, and I think it really goes even beyond just for hackers, for anyone who's, you know, in their career of facing, you know, a frustration at uh, whatever point they're at, you know, it's helpful to, you know, take into context what, you know, you just mentioned. Um, and, you know, going off that, I think it's worth uh, taking some questions from the audience at this point. So I know we have a couple of questions that have been asked, but if you have any uh, that are on your mind right now, for those of you who are watching, uh, be sure to throw them in the chat and we'll try and answer a couple of those. I actually read one very interesting uh, by Dextrom. Um, this hacker is asking, being in such a position with responsibility, how do you handle the pressure from higher ups? So I think will definitely apply to, to your position. You know, maybe in, in the Google I like the question. Zero. Yeah. <laughs> Are we talking, good. Is this talking about currently at Hacker One or currently at uh, Google Project Zero? Is, is that more for that time? I will say that um, it applies to everything, but maybe both. Uh, you know, the pressure you got in in, in Project Zero probably was different um, because, of course, you get you know external pressure from a bunch of companies that you're you're finding vulnerabilities for. But also here, you know, in Hack One, you're uh, advocating for hackers, and you have a bunch of you know big company names. So definitely, I think you can ask whatever you want, <laughs> but I think it's oh, very interesting on both sides of of that. I'll answer it twice then, I suppose. Uh, I think the easier answer is is here at Hacker One. I mean, um, at the risk of sounding immodest, I am now the higher up. <laughs> so, <laughs> um, to a, to a large extent, you know, if there is um, if there is some disagreement, I uh, have a have a very senior role where I can take a, take take anything that need that um, I think needs discussing and discuss it directly with the CEO or or with the the um, the full executive uh, staff community to report to the CEO. You know, I can. Um, uh, I can go and I can discuss things with um, uh, Alex Rice. We mentioned earlier our, our CTO and co-founder. So, um, it, Hacker One, it, it, I think it's easier for me to to, to raise difficult topics. Um, which so I think maybe the more interesting question was, you know, at uh, in Project Zero, how do you handle pressure from higher ups when they're there are the when you know when again the, the press is making a, a mountain out of a molehill, you know, for some some bug that won't matter at all in a few years time right but it's all over the press and you know and even executives at a company like google can um not have that necessary maturity to just be calm and let the <laughs> and let the let the tides go in and out right so uh, yeah how do you uh how, how do you handle that well uh, the way we handle that at, at google product zero is we we tried to what we're trying to do what we did is we tried to place the authority within our culture and our um, our mission and our policies. So 
for example, if if our mission was to make um, make O day hard to make you know the internet safer, so it just we essentially picked a mission that no one can really disagree with, right? No one really wants to not make the internet safer at Google. And then within that, we were the experts in knowing what needed to be done. So the way the way we try to resolve disagreements with higher ups at Google is like, look, hey, do you are you behind this mission? And yes, of course, everyone's behind the mission, make the internet safer. And then we said, well, we're the experts, and um, you know, and you know we are, and we have determined that this this makes the internet safer. So a ninety day disclosure deadline. You know, we've we've, uh, you know, we're the experts here. We, and we've also run some data uh, supporting this. This makes the internet safer. We're going to do it. Um, you know, you can tell us not to, but then you are essentially you know lying about being behind the mission um so we try yeah we just tried to use uh, the mission and the policy to um focus conversations with anyone who's upset both internally or externally and, and just saying look you need to have the maturity <laughs> to, to see that what we're doing here is is like we've actually calculated the actions we're taking here to be pro internet safety so let's you know take our emotions out of it and and get back to the science the data and the expertise we have in the team That's great. And I think we are pretty much in time here. I don't think we have a bunch of extra questions, at least related with the topic, of course. Um, Nick? Yeah. yeah, I think maybe we can uh, close with, uh, you know, Chris, if you could give a, a piece of advice to all the hackers out there who are listening, um, you know, any, any advice you have, whether it's related to bug bounty or just general, you know, you've, you've had this... Uh, You've seen it all in the security to time span of 25 years being a hacker. What, what advice would you give to those watching? Stay curious. Stay curious in all aspects of everything. So uh, again, I think we're going back to something we discussed earlier, which is we can sort of um, have a split of advice between the technical and maybe the more, um, more like advice along the emotional dimension. But in all aspects, stay curious. So on the technical side, you know, if you're, if you're learning how to try and trigger a certain type of vulnerability, um, be curious not about only the, the how you trigger the vulnerability, but um, always ask why. You know why did this vulnerability occur? Um, you know what was the code defect that that led to this? You know why did why might the developer have made this this defect? And the more you sort of dig in with why, 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 I think the the, the broader understanding you'll get of of the technology that of why the technology is falling over that leads to some of these vulnerabilities and the, the just the, the more powerful you'll be as a hacker in terms of being able to understand the more complicated issues and find the more complicated issues as well as the, the simple issues. So stay curious. And on the more emotional side, you know, if you're getting a, a result you don't like uh, from from someone on a program, uh, and again, being curious, why? Why did this? Why does this person instead of like you can find a rage or you can be curious? Like why is this not applicable? Um, why do you not think there's a risk here? Why do you not think? Uh, that this could chain with another bug and actually have a, a, a more serious impact. Why, why, why? Curious, curious, curious. That's my that's my advice. Well, we, we appreciate that advice, Chris. And I know that the hackers are going to be really excited to have you advocating for them as chief hacking officer. And we appreciate your time on this uh, Monday morning. It was a delight to be invited here. Thank you very much. That was awesome. I appreciate it. Thank you very much, Chris, uh, for being here. Um, See you next time, I guess. Yeah, until next time. Yeah. See you. Thank you. Okay, that was great. Um, enjoyed yeah. that that talk. Uh, it was very nice. A lot of uh, knowledge, I will say. Uh, a lot of experience. Very good. And to the chat, I we know you were asking a bunch of questions. We normally try to keep it within the subject we're talking. So sometimes if you ask about how to start in, in back money, we'll try to answer that in, in, the, in the chat maybe, but those normally are, are harder questions and maybe it doesn't really uh, fit with the, the things we're talking or with the guests. Um, so sorry if we didn't cover the question. Um, I did my best trying to answer some, uh, but you know we appreciate all the all the chat, all the people asking and, and you know questions and chatting here. Uh, Thank you very much for that. Um, seems that we do have a couple of more minutes. Uh, we do have like six minutes. So I think it's um, time. It's time. Giveaway time. Right? <laughs> it's giveaway time. It's swag time. What are we giving away? Uh, 
I don't know if Nick, if you know, but then oh, maybe nah, I, I'm back, going can, to can check answer. with the producers and the in our ears. <laughs> <laughs> we have uh, five links to give away, so we're oh. really excited. And it's and, going to be a surprise, uh, surprise swag pack. So, Hacker One swag for all the listeners out there who are able to uh, snag one of those. And I think we're going to get started on that. That's awesome. But before we do that, I will say two things. First of all, if you are here in the chat and you are new, make sure you click the follow button, the, the, the little heart shape, right? And click on the bell so you turn on notifications. There is a lot of first time charities out there. So make sure you click and follow so you are uh, you know, receiving notifications for the next stream. And secondly, second thing I wanted to mention, I got a couple of whispers about last week giveaway, um, which we are tracking. We asked everyone to send an email and we, you know, definitely have your name. So don't worry if you haven't uh, received your link or your email or whatever, we will be sending those very soon. That's Naham saying in the chat saying it's his fault and saying sorry. So just uh, want to mention that. Don't worry. We know who you are. We send the, you know, we receive your email. So you will get your, your price. Okay. So let's do our giveaway. Okay. All right. We're going to put the keyword in the chat in three, two, one. Right. Whoa. I love it. <laughs> it's like Captain America. So that's... go ahead. Exclamation mark. Is that the word, Nick? Yep. Exclamation mark. Um, exclamation Captain point America. Point. Exclamation point. Okay. So go with that very quickly. We'll stop it in a couple of minutes. So go. Go crazy with it. Spam. Spam the, the chat so we get your participation code there's a bunch of people already applying love it really a fitting uh a fitting code for today <laughs> yeah grandpa it was code from last week so yeah don't use that one use uh captain america that's that's the one you need thank you ben yeah grandpa Ari. <laughs> make sure you use captain america not grandpa Ari, please <laughs> there's people already using grandpa Ari. okay Definitely. Captain America. Come on. Captain Captain America. Oops, see, we got some first time chats. Yeah, we have a bunch of those. Again, remember, click follow, click notifications. Uh, so you hear about the next couple of streams. Um, do we know who we have next week as guests? Is that something we can announce? Something we know or not? I think we'll be announcing that on Twitter. Yeah. Awesome. So we will be sharing that. On Twitter very soon. Make sure you follow Hacker on Twitter and let me share the link. So you get all the announcements. Okay, do we are we ready to get the first winner? Okay, go follow follow hacker one Twitter. So all right. 20 more seconds. That's what we get from the backstage. 20 more seconds to participate. Make, make sure you type Captain America with the exclamation point at the very beginning. John Haxor, I, I remember that name. There's a bunch of people we know. I saw Neiman over there. There's a bunch of sneaky snake. It's always fun reading the names. <laughs> yeah, it's super hard to read the names and... and yeah, we need to be careful. Sometimes the names are kind of kind of tricky. Yeah. <laughs> Keep okay. an eye out. Five more seconds. That's what I get. Five. Let's yeah. Five. Four. Three. Two. One. Let's go in a mode. Yes, that's it. That was perfectly synchronized. Okay, so we will be giving the first winner. Who is the first winner? Drum rolls. Compendium 66. Congratulations. Congrats, Compendium. Compendium. <laughs> yeah. Let's get the next one. Shell Raddy, I think. Shell Raddy? Yeah. 
Shell Rally, Shell Shell Rally. Yeah, congratulations. DK ninety five ten. Is that correct? Donkey Kong maybe ninety five ten. Congrats, Donkey Kong. <laughs> That's the and next one is for you, Cypher, Nick. Go, go, go. Uh, <laughs> Cypher one, two, three, two, two, one. Yeah, that's it. <laughs> and the last one, what's up, Doc? Bugs Money. That's you know, that's <laughs> easy for us to read. <laughs> all right, what's well, up? congrats what's to all up, the winners man? of the swag packs. We will definitely uh, be in contact and um, gonna double check with the producers in the background if we need to send anything right now or if we'll be contacting you yeah so we'll probably send you a whisper okay I am, i'm already getting whispers from some winners uh oh, if you want we have yes. heard from the hamsack that he will send whispers to the winners right now awesome so, so when a hamsack is just whispering that's even better yeah and I think in that case, you know, we're, we appreciate everyone who joined today. We're looking forward to, I think Ari and I will both be hosting next week, uh, unless, you know, anything changes. So whispers, <laughs> uh, no, we should be good. Thank you very much, Nick, for doing such an amazing co-host work. And mm -hmm. thank you everyone for joining once again, every single Monday, we are getting a bunch of people. You know, sometimes it's early morning or very late for some. So I appreciate it very much. Thank you for joining once again. See you next Monday with a new episode of Mentorship Mondays. All See right. you, Nick. See you, Ari. Thanks, everyone. Thank you.